spent a lot of time today talking about improving clinical trials. Uh, much of what's been said throughout the day today is relevant to this working group, and we look forward to uh, getting together in a few minutes to try to identify um, some gaps, try to identify some strategic uh, initiatives for moving forward and improving clinical trials. Um, really, how might we provide the right treatment uh, to the right patient uh, for the right problem at the right time in the right dose uh, and the right duration? Um, so one size will not fit all without question. Um, and if we're looking for some sort of treatment for traumatic brain injury, I think we're looking in the wrong place and in the wrong direction. Um, I would wholeheartedly support an approach uh, similar to what Professor Brody had to say this morning about systematically treating what we can treat, identifying things uh, that have evidence to support uh, the efficacy of that treatment for that problem and apply it to specific groups of patients. We have a domain in clinical trials where we have summarized some of the key points, mostly what are some of the lessons learned, you'll see in the document, what are some of the gaps, and what are some of the priorities. And I'm hoping that's what we work on this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, taking lessons learned, recognizing gaps, and identifying priorities. Lessons learned, you've heard a lot today about heterogeneity. Um, I'm not even sure what it means. Uh, this, this is, there is so much heterogeneity in so many ways, it's truly bewildering. Just the heterogeneity of how the person was prior to the injury is supremely complex. And if we take something simple, like major depressive disorder, not all the mood disorders, let's just take one, let's just take major depressive disorder, and, and I keep hearing about mental health outcomes following traumatic brain injury as if um, depression is in fact one of many, and we have spent the last 50 years trying to better understand depression and better understand the treatment for depression and, and mechanisms by which treatments work. Um, depression arises from the cumulative effects we think, complex interactive effects of genetics, early life experiences, and current life stress. Now it sounds simple to say that, but if we're just thinking about a single episode of major depressive disorder, and we think about the genetic underpinnings, we think about the whole, the entire life history of that person leading up to that point, not just adverse events in childhood, but personality factors, resilience, and other aspects of vulnerability. And then we talk about current life stress. And then all of you physicians in the room think about the medical problems that can contribute to the development of depression. Um, heart disease, diabetes, inactivity, all sorts of neurological problems, aging, chronic pain. Uh, this is a complex problem in and of itself, and it's one of many that we're talking about today in depression, I mean, in traumatic brain injury. So we have important lessons that we have learned in the past uh, in traumatic brain injury clinical trials. Uh, these have to do with sort of treating TBI as a unidimensional phenomena. Um, one, another lesson is maybe being overly focused on acute treatment um, and a little less focused on post-acute chronic and long-term treatments. Uh, we have uh, struggled trying to identify mechanisms of action for pharmaceuticals, uh, both in preclinical models and in clinical trials. Some of our, um, if, we, if you see these uh, categories here, lessons learned, recommendations for pharma, going beyond medications, thinking about device-based treatments that you heard about this morning, like TMS, thinking about light therapies, thinking about cognitive therapies, thinking about rehab approaches, thinking about using exercise as medicine. There's a lot of progress we can make in providing more um, better designed treatments for specific patient populations for specific problems at specific times. 
A little bit of the complexity, a little bit of the heterogeneity of this is illustrated in this simple figure. Um, I could do an hour lecture on social psychological factors influencing outcome from mild traumatic brain injury, uh, but that's just one part of the biopsychosocial context for a single person's experience with this injury at varying points in time across their recovery trajectory. So these symptoms and problems that a person might experience can be um, interactive and reinforcing and amplifying. And one way to think about uh, phenotypes is to think about, I wonder if there are some phenotypes in which there are core symptoms that are connected to other symptoms in a very meaningful way. And if you can identify those core symptoms and provide targeted evidence-informed treatments for those, you might dampen the interconnections with these other symptoms. This is a, a little bit of a new way to think about the architecture of how symptoms are intermingled uh, in people following this injury. Um, there's a lot going on in clinical psychology right now on network analysis and network theory. And network theory, I think, can help us in the space of improving uh, TBI clinical trials by helping us better understanding the static and dynamic architecture of symptoms and problems. The network theory is really agnostic to underlying cause. If we think that there's a single underlying latent disease model for traumatic brain injury, and this combination of symptoms and problems that you're seeing on the screen, uh, we need our heads examined, uh, because this is a complex system that's going to present in different ways with different people. So I, I think that one way to think about this is think about, I've, I've been spending my career trying to get us to broaden our lens and, and see uh, the breadth of what we can learn from psychiatry and rehab medicine and psychology and social psychology uh, and developmental theory and neuroscience. I'm now thinking that we should narrow our lens and get laser focused on certain things from a broad perspective. So we're informed more broadly, but we're laser focused. And I think if we do that, we'll be able to develop effective clinical trials. One of the big issues that we face is outcome assessment. And you've heard it often about, we have these crude outcome measures like the Glasgow Outcome Scale. Well, the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended is a lovely outcome measure. Uh, it depends on how you use it. A hammer is a lovely tool. It, it can be effective for a lot of things, uh, but you don't want to necessarily use it uh, for, for working in, in the chest cavity. Uh, but it's a, it's a lovely thing for getting certain things done and the Glasgow Outcome Scale. We don't need to throw it under the bus. It, it can be good for certain things. But there's a group of people around the U.S. Um, Jeff Manley, Mike McRae, Joe Giacino, a, a large number of people who are trying to move forward with the Endpoints Initiative to develop better endpoints for uh, TBI clinical trials. And these are some of the areas in which they're trying to make improvements to move beyond sort of crude outcome measures. In conclusion, we're facing uh, tremendous challenges with heterogeneity, as we know. Um, from the person's unique biopsychosocial perspective, their individual vulnerabilities, uh, and their response to injury. We have um, a long way to go to try to come up with personalized precision rehabilitation. But personalized precision rehabilitation takes into account that person's individual experience of symptoms and problems and how they're manifesting in that person's daily life and, and targets those problems in an evidence-informed way. And we can find, I believe we can find phenotypes uh, that we can be very effective with with clinical trials if we approach it in that manner. Some gaps, making sure. Um, we want to try to not just improve our research design, but our, our analytic methods. You heard some this morning about how to, how to design clinical trials in a way that you can get more done for less money much faster in terms of enrolling patients. Um, I think that if we can enrich our clinical trials 
with patients at the right time who have the conditions of interest that we want to try to affect change on, um, that, that requires specialized assessment, um, specialized assessment to target the specific problems that we want to enrich that trial with. Um, and then the Endpoints Initiative will be very important for helping us better understand the, some of the work that I'm doing, for example, is how do you design a single cognition endpoint? Um, a lot of you in the room are frustrated with us in neuropsychology because you ask us things like, oh, what's the best test? And we'll never give you an answer because there isn't one. Or you say, how many tests is enough tests? And we won't give you an answer on that. And you say, well, could you take your battery that's four hours and make it two? We say, maybe. And you say, can you go from two to one? And we say, we could, but we're going to lose a lot of information. And then you say, well, can you go from one to 20 minutes? Because that's what my trial will allow is 20 minutes or five minutes. Uh, when I do this work in psychiatry, the psychiatrists are very impatient. The psychiatrists want a neuropsych testing done in like four to seven minutes. Can, can we work that out for their trials? Um, what, what I've been working on for some time is how do we take a combination of cognitive test scores from any battery of tests given anywhere in the world in any language with any group of people and mathematically combine them into a robust single cognition endpoint uh, that is a meaningful endpoint, that it's sensitive, it's reliable, and it's meaningful for the patient. I think we're making progress and we're going to be able to make some recommendations in the near future on that one aspect of trying to improve endpoints for TBI clinical trials. And I know others are working on an, a number of other assessments and endpoints that might help us in our trials. Thank you.